Hey everyone, welcome once again to What Does That Piece Do? My name's Joe, and today I'm going to be taking you through the Red Bernus, Algeria 1857. This is a 1-4 player co-op game set in a very particular interesting part of history, which I'm going to go through in a little bit, but I'm going to show you how to play the game. The game is designed by Matt Shoemaker and Roberta Taylor, released on Hit Him With a Shoe. That was a Kickstarter I just got this year. Um, artwork by Alcine Blibeck. I hope I am pronouncing that correctly. And the cultural consultation was done by Kareem Oras. So as usual, I'm going to take you through how to play the game, get you up and started, give you enough confidence to get, get playing this. I'm going to give you historical background as well too, uh, as I always do, and really follow up on a particular piece of this game, which is a really interesting character in history. Um, so stick around for that too, but hey, as always, if you just want to get to the teach, you just want to learn how to play, you can jump to that. That'll be in the time code down below, all right? Um, but hey, while you're down there, please do hit like and subscribe because I am going to continue to do videos just like this, and I really hope you enjoy them. All right, so let's get into the background here. The game is set in 1857. Uh, it's really in the context of the second French colonial empire, the 1800s in general. Uh, France uh, had you know, lost some of their territories from that first uh, colonial phase. They lost some territories to the British and the Spanish, and they're looking to expand in other parts of the world, uh, like Asia and uh, Africa, specifically North Africa, where this game is set. Um, this is a region where the Ottoman Empire was kind of starting to wane here. It's so right across the water, right across the Mediterranean for France, so they set their eyes on that because um, the Ottoman Empire, they really couldn't uh, control the land that much. This was the sick man of Europe, was also the not too healthy dude of Africa, so uh, French thought this is an opportunity to grab up some more land. The Janissaries then, the Ottomans, the military might was starting to wane. They were starting to pull out. You know, they put up some resistance, but in a lot of cases, they just hightailed it back to the motherland, said nuts to this. They went back to Turkey. One fighter in particular, though, uh, Abd al Qadir. Uh, he was a Muslim scholar, military leader. He declared jihad against the French, um, but he ultimately surrendered in 1847. So he's really the last piece of Muslim resistance to French uh, incursion into Algeria. But there was still a group of people in the Atlas Mountains, specifically a region called Jurjura. These are the Kabylia people in the Kabylia region. They were bear bears. Bear bears were all across North Africa and Morocco, Tunisia, Libya. This particular group, though, they were dug right into the Jurjura region. Um, and the French really uh, couldn't get them out of there. They tried multiple times. There's a lot of resistance. A lot of the villagers fought back uh, throughout the 1850s. In the spring of 1857, though, that's when France's governor general of Algeria, Jacques-Louis Randon, he brought in over 35,000 troops, brought in cavalry and artillery units to gather in the foothills of the Atlas Mountains, start making their way in and try and subdue these Kibidae people. This game is the story of that final French incursion. One four players will work cooperatively to try and hold back the French. They'll take control of pieces in the villages on the map, uh, the French are going to come in from three different entry points. Uh, you're not quite sure where they're going to end up, but uh, you're going to have to fend them off because when the French armies come into those villages, that's when a battle is going to ensue if you have pieces there. You're going to be rolling dice, see who can knock out each other first, make the other retreat. However, before the French even get there, uh, you can maybe ambush them and uh, keep them from even coming in in the first place. So the French are controlled by an automata deck, and the players are going to have cards, and they're going to be able to control pieces. The whole goal then is to outlast that French automata deck, right? If by the end of the game, the players haven't surrendered an entire region or and retreated from another village or surrendered two regions, then if you manage to hold out long enough and that doesn't happen when the last card is resolved and drawn from the French deck, that means the players have won. So with that in mind, Let's grab all these wooden bits, let's shuffle up these beautiful cards, let's uh, look at this beautiful board here, um, let's hit the table, let's go, or as they say in Algerian Bear Bear, Laya Ad Nebdu. There are three types of cards in Red Bernus. The aforementioned automata cards that drive the French pieces, village cards which the players lay out in front of them, and the cards that the players will use to conduct their actions. Within these player cards, those fall into three different categories. Starter cards, which each player starts out with in their hands, leader cards, of which each player will get one at the beginning of the game, 
and market cards which are recruitable by players at the end of their turn. And then there's eight types of market cards and multiples of each of them. The village cards are given to each player at the beginning of the game and represent a village on the map. Depending upon how many players, the number of cards are divided between them as per the rulebook, but I'll mostly focus on the three player setup where each player will control a distinct region as represented by the color on the cards and map spaces. Throughout the game, players will be able to take cards from their hand and place them in the villages, which may trigger some instant effects. Otherwise, it's a handy way to store cards so they can be accessed on a later turn when the card's special power may come in handy or when the purchase value may be used to purchase other cards in the market. Or you may just want to get them out of your deck to increase your chances of drawing the more useful cards later on. Each player's starting hand will consist of villagers with somewhat generic names, woman, man, elderly woman, young man, child, and artisan being the only somewhat distinct name. The players will also have their choice of leader card. These ones have a different type of layout and there's only one of each. Deal these out randomly. As the rulebook says, deal each player two and they can keep one, returning the other, which won't be used at all in the game. Some of these leaders have their own piece, which may be placed on the map in one of the player's villages when the card is used later on in play. Some of the leader cards, as well as a few of the village cards, will come with some other benefits such as cards from the market or these very handy reroll tokens. If one of those leader cards tells you to take a Mujahideen or Sharp Shooter from the market, those also allow the player to take the corresponding piece and place that in one of their villages as well. With that said, let's now take a look at some of the pieces that the players control, how they move on the map, and how they square off against the French forces. The players will control the placement, and in some cases the movement, of four types of pieces that are color-coded as well as the leader pieces, which attack and ambush with the same power as their light-colored cubes. The red pieces are Mujahadite. They are placed in a village on the map when particular cards are placed by the players with those village cards in their tableau on their turn. These Mujahadite can't be mobilized by a player on their turn. They'll stay in their village and fight the French when they enter. When fighting, each cube in the space will roll a red die. The white cubes are Mujahideen, and the yellow are the sharpshooters. Unlike Mujahideite, they can get placed with their respective card is purchased from the market by the player. They can be mobilized during a player turn, moving from one village to another, as long as those villages are still controlled by the player. That's the mobilize action. But there is a card from the starting deck that allows some pieces to move between players' villages. Just like the Mujahideite, they can be used to defend the village when the French enter, rolling their respective colored cube. But these pieces can also be used to ambush, which is attacking the French army that's deployed in a space approaching that village. Like a battle, the dice are rolled and the French will respond with a limited attack. This is really a way of whittling down the French forces, so they either enter a village with smaller numbers and are easier to defeat, or their forces may be depleted and force them to retreat even before they reach a village, buying the players more time. I'll get into the details of Ambush more as we get into the gameplay. These purple cylinders represent defenses. Like the Mujahideen and the Sharp Shooters, they can only be placed when that card is purchased in the market. They don't move between villages and don't have any attack function, but they can halt a French army and stop them from advancing into a village. More on that later when we look at the battles in the villages. The leaders, as mentioned, roll their dice when defending a village against the French. They can also be used in ambush if they're in a village with the specific ambushing piece, Mujahideen or Sharpshooter. When those are being used to trigger that ambush, the leaders join them. They can be mobilized along with those pieces in the same way. They can only move between villages when their specific card is played on the controlling player's turn. Some of the French pieces, the cavalry, the carabiniers, and the artillery also have corresponding dice that are used in battles. The other ones that don't are these sapper pieces. They're used for removing defenses when the French enter the village. These three distinct pieces represent the armies themselves. The fighting pieces will just go into those army boxes, and the special pieces will show where they are on the map. They themselves don't have dice, they just represent the whole army and their position. At the end of each player's turn, whatever cards are left in their hand after taking their three potential actions, those will be used to purchase cards in the market, if possible. 
players will count up these symbols on those cards, add them all together, and that will be the purchasing power. The symbols indicate influence, military strength, food, tools, and weapons. Players can purchase one or two cards per turn, and the values can be split however they like from that card total. The cost of purchase is indicated along the bottom of each market card. As mentioned, the Mujahideen, Sharpshooter, and Defenses cards all have immediate effects of placing their corresponding piece in one of that player's villages. The other cards will be more useful later, either for their purchasing power or card effects as written on the text. Purchase cards go immediately in the player's discard pile to be drawn on a future turn, whether they are used to place a piece or not. Note that based on the player count, there's a limited number of Mujahideen, Mujahideit, and Sharpshooters, and thus there's a limited number of cards for Mujahideen and Sharpshooter. There's always eight defense pieces, no matter the player count. So let's get into the gameplay, starting with the setup. Give every player their starting deck of cards and randomly assign the villages based on the rulebook. Three player, which I'll be focusing on, is pretty straightforward. Otherwise, you'll need to divvy them up in a more interesting way. Read the text on the village cards to see which players get special bonuses for those villages. Deal two leader cards to each player. They choose one and get the respective leader piece to eventually place on the map along with any other bonuses. So don't place those leaders when you select the cards. Sorry, I got a little carried away here. You're going to place them on the map later. Each player shuffles their leader card in with their starting deck along with any other cards that they may have got from their village cards places it all face down next to them. They'll be the draw pile for their turn. Place two times the number of players in Mujahedite cubes by the players. They'll be able to access them and place them in villages when playing the proper card. Set up the market cards. There will be eight stacks in total. With the limitation on how many Mujahideen and Sharpshooter cards and pieces are available as outlined in the rulebook. In our three-player setup, that will mean 15 Mujahideen and six sharpshooters, which we had at the beginning of the setup, but you'll remember some of the players took a few Mujahideens as per their leader cards. Keep the reroll tokens, the retreat and surrender markers nearby, as well as the dice that the players will get to roll for their pieces in the battles. Put the French army piece special pawns, the ones representing their position on the map, in their respective army boxes for now. Shuffle these starting location chevrons and place them face down randomly by the three army boxes. Now take the well shuffled automata deck and draw one card for each player in the games. So with three players that will be three cards total. One by one resolve the troop placement icons in the bottom right starting with army one. Ignore any other text on the card, but make note of what other things might happen in these automatic cards as the game progresses. If Army 1 reaches its deploy level, which is 6 pieces total, then any additional pieces spill over into Army 2. Then, any army that's reached its deploy threshold, again that's 6 pieces for Army 1 and Army 3, 8 pieces for Army 2, those will now deploy. Flip over the chevron that says which space that army starts from and move their single piece with the corresponding symbol into that space on the board. Now that everyone has their cards, bonus pieces, pieces on the map, Mujahideen, and the army pieces are in their respective armies, you're ready to start. Now, on the player's turn, they will draw up five cards. They'll be able to take up to three actions, of which there are four to choose from. You can do any combination of them that you want. You can do the same action multiple times if you like. Once that's done, whatever cards you have left in your hand, you'll be able to use to purchase things from the market for the value on the top of the card. So when you're purchasing them, they'll go into your discard pile. The cards that you use, their value to purchase, they're going to go into the discard pile as well. All right. So end of your turn, you're not going to have any cards left in your hand. They're either going to be in your discard, in your villages or in your draw pile. After a certain amount of player turns and the French will respond, that will include drawing the French automatic deck, resolving that completely, see where they move to. If they move into a space and there's pieces there into one of the villages, then a battle is going to ensue. But if no battle ensues, then go to the next player. So depending upon the amount of players you have, it'll, it'll depend on when the French respond. If it's two or four player, it's every time two players go, 
French respawn. Two players go, French respawn. If it's a three player game like I got set up here, be first player, second player, French, the third player, and the French again. You keep on repeating in that fashion. So now let's take a look at what those player actions are. After drawing the five cards at the start of their turn, players can take up to three actions. They're all outlined on these little player aid cards. The first is to use the card for a special ability as outlined on the text. That may mean drawing extra cards, relocating one of your Mujahideen or sharpshooters, placing your leader piece or relocating them on the map. That card goes into the discard pile and its symbols won't be used for any purchasing power at the end of the turn. Each card used in this way counts as one action. Another action can be used to reserve one card in your village or retrieve all cards already stored in any one village. So you could reserve one card in a village, another card in that same village, or another village altogether, and then retrieve from one of your villages that's taking on the cards. That would then use all three of your actions. Or use all three to reserve, or all three to retrieve. Know that some of the cards in your starting hand may have special powers when placed in a village, but it may depend on whether there's already a piece in that village on the map, for example, the elderly man card. There may be an instance where you're placing that card in a village just for its special bonus power and then retrieving it with the rest of the cards that are already in that village. So in total, that would be placing and retrieving two actions. Some cards will allow you to retrieve just one card from that village when placing. Another allows you to move a card from that village to another village. The next action is mobilize. This will allow you to move any group of your Mujahideen or sharpshooters in one of your village on the map to another of your villages for one action. They move as one unit. If you had two pieces in one village and wanted to split them to two different villages, that would cost you two of your three available actions. Likewise, if you're bringing two from different villages together into a third, that's two actions. Reminder that the leader pieces can't be mobilized this way. You need to discard their specific leader card as an action. Mujahidite can't be mobilized at all. They stay put. The final action is ambush. This will require a card from your hand with a specific piece matching in one of your villages, plus a card with the weapons symbol to be discarded. So that's two cards discarded for one action. Since the weapons card can only be acquired in the market, it might be a few turns until you can get that unless one of your leader cards has a weapon symbol on it. That piece, along with any other pieces in the same village, either Mujahideen, Sharpshooter, or Leader, are now going to ambush together. They don't have to be matching. If you have a Mujahideen in one of your villages, you can discard the Mujahideen card from your hand plus a weapons card. If there's a Sharpshooter and a Leader in that village, they'll join the ambush as well. Of course, Mujahideen, they do not. Ambushing group must be able to trace a route to an advancing army that doesn't pass through any other player's villages. That route can pass through the acting player's village, though. The army must be on the map, which means not at the starting point of their deployment path. The player will now roll the corresponding dice with their attacking pieces. Leaders will roll the matching colored die. With any hits on the dice rolled, the acting player may choose which pieces to remove from that army. The French, they respond, they roll the number of dice equal to half the number of ambushing pieces rounded up. So if there's three ambushing pieces, that would be two dice. Use the hit order chart on the reverse side of the player aid to see which type of dice are rolled. If there's any cavalry, it will roll those dice. If not, carabinier dice. Any hits will result in the player pieces being removed as per the hit order on the bottom half of that chart. Sharpshooters and Mujahideen are removed from the game. Leaders will go back to the player supply. They basically just got injured and need to heal. They might re-enter play. Note that these dice rolls are simultaneous. So even if the player chose to take out a cavalry with their hits initially, if they were present at the beginning of the battle, their dice will be used. Also, remember that if you have any of these reroll tokens, they can be cashed in and attempt to reroll any of the dice, the player's dice or the French dice. Once the hits are applied, if the French army has hit its retreat level, that's again two pieces for army one and three, or three pieces for army two, that army retreats to the starting point on the map. They've been pushed back and won't advance again until the next turn if they hit their deployment threshold. 
Otherwise, they stay in place on the map. The remaining bear bear units will return to any one of the player's villages. So if they came ambushing from the far end of your cluster of villages, this is also a way of mobilizing the forces as one, even the leaders. So players can do a combination of those actions, up to three of them. That could be reserving three cards, or reserve, mobilize, then ambush. Or discard the card for its ability, retrieve and ambush. Or retrieve, ambush, ambush, whatever you like. After the player has done their three actions, now they can take whichever cards are left in their hand, add up the purchase points to acquire one or two cards from the market. If this was a heavy turn of discarding cards or reserving them in your village, you might not have much left. Otherwise, count up all the points across the cards and spend them any way you like. Then, discard those cards, and your turn is over. On to the next player who will do the same. Draw five, take three actions, resolve any ambushes, purchase from the market, and end with an empty hand. On the French turn, first check to see if there are any retreated armies, and if there's any pieces in the reinforcement space. If so, take the pieces from that space, and put them in the retreated army with the most pieces already in it. The first French turn of the game, this probably won't be the situation. Then, draw the top card of the Automata deck. Start by looking at the symbols in the bottom right, and add that number of corresponding pieces to the lowest number army that hasn't been deployed. That would be army 1 unless it's deployed, then it would be army 2, and then next army 3. If all armies are deployed, those pieces go to any armies that have been retreated those that are back at their starting points but haven't yet hit their deploy threshold again, starting with the army with the most pieces in it already. If tied, then the lowest number is that army. If there are no retreated armies, then the pieces will go into the reinforcement space to be added to retreated armies at the start of a future turn. Next, read and execute the text at the bottom of the card, if any. This may include adding artillery pieces to a specific army, whether or not they are deployed. Or it may ask players to trash a card from their supply, that could be from their draw deck or discard or from one of their villages. Then, any army that is deployed will now advance one space towards the next unsurrendered village. If there are multiple options for movement, refer to the symbol on the top left of the French card and move the army in the direction of that next closest symbol on the map. Note that the bottom text may tell the armies to move twice or not at all this turn. Now, we check to see if any combat will ensue. If the French army has entered any of the Bear Bear villages, they will attempt to seize it. But first, check to see if there are any defenses in the village. As you'll recall, defenses are placed in a village when a player buys that card in the market. If there are defenses and the advancing army has any sapper units, remove one defense from the village and one sapper from the army. If all defenses are removed this way, then the battle continues. If there's no sappers, remove one piece from the army, starting with carabiniers, then artillery, then cavalry, until defenses are removed. If non-sapper units are used in this way, that army does not then enter the village yet for battle, but remains outside it. Leave the piece on the path approaching the village to remind you, because that village may not build any more defenses on the next turn before the army enters. Otherwise, it's time for battle but pay close attention to the text on the village cards as they may indicate whether or not certain French pieces are effective. Sumer in particular is interesting. The French army might just bypass it altogether. Taking these village card instructions into account, artillery will be first to attack. Roll the black die for each artillery piece, then apply the hits as per the hit order. Next, players will get to roll their sharpshooter dice for any in that village then apply those hits as per the hit order on the chart. Next, the French and Bear Bears attack simultaneously. Any remaining Mujahideen, Mujahideite, and leader dice are rolled, along with any remaining Carabiniers and Cavalry. Apply the hits, keeping in mind whether the defending player has any reroll tokens. These can be lifesavers. When Mujahideite, Mujahideen, Sharpshooter and defense pieces are removed in battle, they are gone from the game. After the first round of battle, if the French side has been reduced to the retreat level, they retreat. If not, the Bear Bear defenders have the option to retreat themselves. If there are no child or youth cards in that village in the player's tableau, they may place the retreat token on the space and move all of their remaining pieces to one of their other villages. 
take the cards from that village and add them to the player's discard pile. The retreated village may not be entered again by the players. The French just treat it as a stopping point, and that card's turned over and not used anymore in the game. If the defending player loses their last piece in battle for that village, that village, along with that player's other villages, have fallen and are now under the control of the French. Place the flag marker on all of that player's village. And any Mujahideen in those villages, they now join the French army. Fickle guns for hire that they are. They'd now be fifth on the hit list when locked in battle with other Bear Bear players. That player then, sadly, is eliminated from the game. All their village cards are set aside and they can't be used by other players. Much like a retreated space, French armies will treat these spaces as stopping points on the way to other unconquered villages. That eliminated player now runs a French automata deck in pieces if they're not already sulking in the corner. Play continues until either one village has retreated and one player has been conquered and eliminated from the game, or two players and their villages have been conquered and eliminated from the game. Thus, using the retreat token is timely and may save some of your pieces before they're blown away by the French. Use it wisely. If neither of these things happen when the final French card is drawn and resolved, then the players have collectively defended the Kabyle villages from the imperialist invaders. And that is the name of the game, folks. Outlast the French. You still have most of your villages standing, or most of the players still in the game. When that final French card is drawn and resolved, then you'll have won. You've fended the French armies off for now. They all hightail it back to flatter land, and they leave the Kabili people alone, at least for now. So the actual form of the land, the mountain range, the Jura Jura range, really plays a big role in this game. You know, the hills could be too steep for the cavalry to attack, or artillery can't get close enough to be truly effective. Um, but as much as it is about the terrain, it's about the people too. You have these women, children, elderly folks all coming together to fight back the French. But really, it was the leaders that made a huge difference, that brought the people together, that strategized for them to help keep the French out of the villages. One leader in particular, the namesake of the game, Lala Fatma Nisumar. She is going to be the focus of this segment of This Piece Changes History. Lala Fatma Nisumer was born in the village of Urja. She belonged to a marabou, or a religious leader's family, and as one of seven children, she likely received a better education than most young girls of the Kabylia at the time. She pushed back against her arranged marriage as she was betrothed to a man at the age of 15 by her family. Her husband refused to divorce, so she renounced a married life and chose to serve God, became somewhat of a spiritual leader in the community. This act of defiance showed the rebellious spark that would help her face off against the French in the years to come. When the French armies first ventured into the Kabylia regions in 1847, Fatma would have just been in her late teens. The resistance fighters at the time were led by Sheriff Abu Baglia, who was aware of Fatma's fighting prowess along with her regard as a young spiritual leader. In 1854, Fatma, along with her brother Tahar, assembled a fighting force to defend the villages against the incoming 12,000 French troops. This required the women of the villages to come together under Fatma's leadership and participate in the battles. They also took to binding some of the male villagers' legs so they wouldn't retreat and instead stayed to fight. After two days of fighting, the French withdrew their troops to the sound of ululating Kabylia women as the backdrop to their retreat. They would not return for another three years during which time Bubalia passed away, and the leadership vacuum was ultimately filled by Fatma. In 1857, the French returned, with twice the number of troops as the previous encounter, along with 10,000 mules and artillery. Despite the French forces being divided up and approaching in reduced numbers from three strategic entry points into the mountain regions, the Kabylia people were heavily outnumbered in each battle. The French would take one village, and through a series of established alliances, other nearby villages would fall. And in some cases, the Bear Bear fighters would join the French side. As they approached the village where Fatma and Tahar were stationed, they burned fig and olive orchards as they went, in acts of terror and sabotage. On July 11, 1857, the final village fell, 
and with that, Fatma and her brother were captured. With their leader imprisoned, resistance in the region all but ceased. Fatma remained under house arrest until her death in 1863 at the age of 33. She became known as the Joan of Arc of Jojura by both the Algerians and the French. Her ashes were later transferred to a place of prominence in El Aliya Cemetery in 1994. She remains a national icon in Algeria to this day. Playing this game will really give you a sense of what it would have been like to be surrounded by these French armies coming in from three different directions, different paths. You don't know which village they're going to hit first, so you don't know exactly where to place your people that are going to fight back. You're not quite sure where to build defenses, so you kind of have to bide your time. But you know, in the meantime, get some of those ambushes in, and that's the really fun part, actually. Knowing what cards to stash and where for a future turn is going to be really helpful here to help you win. It's all about timing and uh, getting the right hand at the right time. I'd say this is someone who actually hasn't beaten the game yet, so I don't know, maybe your strategy will be better than mine. The Red Burn Noose is a really good way to get uh, non-war gamers to the table. As I said, it's a co-op, so you're all going to be working together to strategize, right? It covers this very little known battle in history and a very big part of history though. Uh, French colonialism, it uh, you know, was all over the world. So this is definitely a piece of that history. It's really great to see this sort of topic being covered. You know, we're so used to certain themes just being kind of pasted on certain games, which is why I really love the approach of the designers here, what they did. Uh, Matt and Roberta working with uh, Kareem is a cultural consultant so now you are hearing the voice of the people this is an actual algerian person that is informing the design of this game i think that's very important the artwork as well uh, alison ablibek uh, does this amazing job of bringing these pictures to life in a way that i've never seen a war game do really with these very evocative uh, paintings of the people and of the land so i think that's really important you know for the most part this hobby still very white western industrialized world this is these are we're the people that have the most free time to play these games you know and the most free time to develop these games but the more and more we can bring in people from the cultures that are being represented to lend their voice and their artistic value and their historical narrative to it the richer the experience is going to be so i'm really looking forward to this trend sort of developing and we see more and more games that are being built like this. Uh, I can't wait to play more and more games like this myself. So this is the point where, you know, I'd normally give some book recommendations, you know, where you to go to learn and read more uh, on this particular topic, this very specific subject. Um, there aren't really that many and really none in English that I could find on Fatma and Samer or uh, the Kabylie people. There's usually books on the larger context of French colonialism in North Africa. Um, but the designers put uh, together a bibliography of a bunch of different articles. Um, that's mostly was their sources for putting this together. But actually, the rule book itself has got some really good stuff in the back of it or around historical context, um, to, if you want to read a bit more. So if you do find a great book on this topic, I'd like to know. I'd, I'd love to read more about it. There's a movie that was made, uh, an Algerian movie. It came out in 2014 uh, called F just Fatma and Nisomer. Um, which uh, I haven't been able to see. It's not on any uh, platform that I can find, digital platform, uh, online anyway. So uh, looking forward to eventually viewing that at some point. Uh, if you get a chance to check it out, let me know too. I'd, I'd like to know how that one is. Um, but yeah, playing the game is going to be the closest I can get to experiencing something like this, this particular battle, this particular uh, conflict between a very large army and a uh, very small, isolated group of people that were trying to fight for their way of life. I hope you get a chance to play this game. Hope you do enjoy it as much as I do. Um, you know, if you do get to play, sound off in the comments. Let me know what you think of it. Let me know if this video helped you at all. Let me know what do you want to play next. What are the games that you'd like to see covered in this format? Because I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep doing more. So, hope you enjoyed this. Hope it was helpful. Thanks. Have a great time, and hope to see you at the table someday. Cheers.